Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Eva van Nuenberg. Uh, he's a theoretical physicist working at the intersection between condensed matter and machine learning, and he's currently an assistant professor at the Niels Bohr International Academy in Copenhagen. He's originally from the Netherlands, where he got his uh, bachelor and, and master's degrees from the University of Leiden. He then moved on to the ETH, ETH in Zurich uh, to, to do uh, his PhD with Sebastian Huber. Uh, and before joining the University of Copenhagen, he was an assistant professor. Um, uh, or he was sorry, he was doing a postdoc at Caltech with uh, Gil Raphael. Um, and uh, yeah, so he'll be talking about AI for, for quantum experience today. And this is a very exciting area where there's a lot of activities also at Chalmers in this area. So um, we are very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Welcome, Eva. Thank you. Great. Good. I'll start re sharing. Yeah, um, great. It's my pleasure actually being here. And uh, um, before I start, I just want to um, let you know you should feel absolutely free to unmute and ask questions or at least raise your hand or type in the chat. I'll do my best to keep an eye on those. Um, and um, if anything is unclear or, or if I'm going too fast or too slow, you should also just let me know and then we can adjust. I'm, I'm hoping to keep it informal and hopefully um, show you some interesting things. So um, um, Simon, you already mentioned, I am now at the Nisbo Institute and I did my, my undergrad, so to say my master's in, in Leiden. I'm going to be moving there again at the end of the year, uh, this time as a, on a tenure track on the other side. That's just uh, something I wanted to quickly add. So I want to let me <clears throat> let me start with um, you know sometimes to some audience a little bit of a provocative you know you know future in that sense but uh, um, maybe for you all who are interested in this it's less provocative and maybe you already have examples of, of where that works so so here you know when this field started a few years ago or like revived let's say a few years ago 2016 more or less. Um, this was the kind of thing that people were at least always, you know, the questions I got were always pointing in this direction, like, hey, can we now ask an AI to compute the ground state of our model? Like what, you know, if it was going to be really useful, it will have to be able to do these things. So you ask your favorite voice assistant, what should I do next? Or how should I do this best? Um, and um, yeah, I don't have any... Um, pictures on this slide for some of the works that I have in mind with these, but I'm sure you can maybe think of some um, that are already, you know, moving in this direction. There are papers that design optical tables um, for generating particular states. Um, fine tuning qubits is something that I will also touch upon, but that's also coming up. Ground state finding, of course, with, with neural network as an ansatz is also an interesting direction to being um, explored very heavily. So it's, I don't think anymore, I don't think these are very far-fetched, at least as concepts anymore. But still, I want to give you a, a bit of a, a flavor of, of other things that, um, that or related things that I think about um, in my research, and that's also sort of setting the context for, for what I want to talk about more. Um, and then, of course, on a, on a more sort of, um, I'm tempted to say more computer science level, but um, I, I have something more to say about that later. Um, you can ask typical information kind of questions, like given that I have done these measurements, what should I measure next in order to you know, best estimate the, st the, the, the state I have in my system or to you know, get the best estimate of my expectation value with the fewest amount of measurements, et cetera. And then you start um, thinking about um, Bayesian estimation, for example, or maximum likelihood uh, method. In the same vein, you can ask, given what I've measured so far, how do I change my interaction with the system in order to do feedback, right? And this is a typical control question, maybe, um, right? And then and you, have, you have entire fields, of course, uh, investigating quantum optimal control of your system. But maybe you don't have a model and you want to have some, some model-free approach that, that learns to control your system. That is a, one typical way of doing that would be with reinforcement learning. 
that's also something that we're actively trying to um, to investigate and then staying on the level of control but specifying it now a little bit more towards quantum information uh, theory uh, and experiments is for example um, if you have now i'm thinking very specifically for those of you who know about syndrome measurements and, and uh, toric code and surface code and stabilizer codes in general you can of course ask um, if you have such a quantum system and you can somehow infer errors or measure errors then uh, given that information how do i best stabilize my quantum information or correct my qubit and that's that's then typically where reinforcement learning is useful i think um and maybe i can already say here so one of the one of the punchlines at least that i often try to make is that with these learning methods as opposed to hand you know hard coded algorithms you immediately learn the intrinsic noise in the system so if your qubit number 5 has a different error rate than your qubit number 17 and you try to make an automatic you know ai agent that learns to control that system whatever control in this case means what you want to achieve then you know by training it on such a system it will automatically start to realize that five is just different than number 17 and that um, that's something that you, you know, it's very tedious to do to say the least if you have to do that manually and characterize each of them separately etc anyway so that's sort of the um the context and what i want to do for the rest of the talk is is showcase some of those at ongoing experiments it's actually um i would say it's mostly these three let's see how far we get um and they're all ongoing and actual experiments that are uh, being executed now at the qdev in in copenhagen um, center for quantum devices and i just list a few of the people who are involved that i these are the people i interact with on uh, on these experiments but that's of course there's of course many more who are in, in the lab and make sure everything is up and running uh, so a lot of the things i will show you on the optimization later um, is, is Tobion and, and uh, Bertram who is making these devices. Um, and then um, Oswin will be relevant for the, uh, the quantum dot tuning. Oswin is a computer scientist um, who was really you know, trained and an expert at the optimization algorithms in this case. And then there's Anasho and Ferdinand, and of course, Charlie Marcus. And Anasho and Ferdinand, Ferdinand really are the, the spin qubit um, experts. So all of this, uh, sorry, the, the bottom two will be the spin qubit. So I will just, I'm going to start with the, um, the multi-qubit um, um, one, because I think it's the simplest. Um, and uh, we can argue afterwards whether anything of this is uh, here is going to be AI or, or even machine learning. Um, but it's the steps towards that. Good. Um, I do want to. I don't want to go into too much detail about how these devices and spin qubits, etc., work, because that's not really the point. Um, um, but it. I think it's important for the context, especially because some of the other things I talk about also um, will rely on it. But so don't focus too much on following along exactly with the physics here. Um, if you if you don't want to follow along at all along at all the statement is that this this device gives you a qubit gives you a, a zero and a one state that you can manipulate but still for those of you who do want to know this is what such a um, a chip device like a device would look like and what you would see it's it's a repeating pattern it's these four like the four corners are this are, are copies of each other and so there's four qubits on this device and we're going to be using for now only one the top left one and so what you see is these uh, orange orange dots these islands um, those are quantum dots and those can host discrete numbers of electrons um, so they um, you know they can be zero on either or one on the left and, and two on the right and etc those are the numbers you see here we'll come back to that in a second and then, um, and then there is this uh, this white square and a, and a black square here. We forget about the blue dot for now. This is where the uh, experimentalist would send in a 
uh, microwave balls and uh, they measure, if you're interested, um, the reflected signal that comes back. Uh, so they send in the microwave pulse here, and then you know, obviously something will happen de here depending on what this, the state of these two orange blobs is. And uh, part of the signal will reflect, and based off of that, you will want to make a decision about what your state, what the, the state of your of your qubit of these two quantum blobs. So, like I said, now um, on top of that, you have these two voltages, two parameters. They can uh, you see them here on the y and the x axis that they can tune, and based on those, you can have these dots occupied with different amounts of charges. In particular, you can have one on the left and one on the right, or two on the left and one on the right, etc. And then uh, to make a qubit, what you can do, uh, you can do many things. Uh, but it, it, essentially, what you do is you you pick two of them, two which you like. They pick the one one state and the two zero state, and um, um, you can start making your qubit out of that. So in the one one state. Um, which means you have one electron on the left, one on the right. The electrons can be in a singlet state or a triplet state. They have to have, uh, right? They, they have opposite spins. Um, and, uh, and those are the two, those are your two um, um, logical states or physical, you know, computational states. So let's say we call the, the singlet is the zero. Sorry, that's hard to read. And the, and the triplet is the one, for example. So whenever I, whenever I write S and T, you you think zero and one, and you can distinguish those. They can read them out. And I just want to mention very quick, quickly by um, that's where the two zero state comes in by by changing the voltages to the two zero state, and then only the singlet can do that because of the symmetry of the wave function. So that's how you do the readout um, if you want to know how that um, works. But yeah, the, the singlet and triplet that's the qubit. So then. Let's discuss that readout for a little bit, um, because depending on whether your state was in the singlet or the triplet, um, so whether it was a, a zero or a one, that readout signal you get, and this is now what they're measuring, the, the amplitude, the voltage here, that V, as a function here of uh, time, there's 3,000 nanoseconds here, and then, you know, here the question is, if I gave you 10,000 of these, would you be able to distinguish which ones are zeros and which ones are ones, right? That's a typical sort of unsupervised learning question. And um, actually, you know, so what, of course, that's not what they were doing in the experiment. Um, what you do in the experiment, like maybe I should say that, say that here, is they use, um, essentially old radio technology, right? It's, it's um, demodulation. So the, the signal that goes in here has a particular frequency, um, omega. And then what you do with the reflected signal is you, you would multiply it with a sine wave of that same you know, omega frequency that goes in. So in here goes omega, and here is a sine omega t that goes in. You multiply that with the original signal and then uh, so that's the that's demodulation and then you integrate the resulting um, value and uh, then if you hit some threshold uh, you can tell whether it's a zero or a one okay that's the old the, the standard procedure homodyne detection typically that's what it that's what it's called um, and that whole pipeline takes a few microseconds you see here there's three microseconds but uh, um, so that you know already is three microseconds maybe they can do with a bit of a shorter signal but overall that the whole process of getting this raw data to a computer multiplying it or doing it in hardware even with the of course with the demodulation takes a few microseconds that's about as fast as they can go and with what i want to show you next which is going to be principal component analysis which is the uh, the hello world sort of linear algebra data analysis tool. So nowadays everything is called machine learning, but um, you know that's the analysis method. You can do this actually. We managed to do this in under a microsecond by putting it on 
on an FPGA too. So I'm sure you all have seen principal component analysis, but um, as a very quick recap here, there's just this image. You, you imagine you have a very large data set, um, for example, um, a point cloud can be in 2D, could be in 500D. Um, and then principal component analysis, which is just linear algebra, will find for you the axis along which the variance of your data is the largest. And that's useful because along that axis, apparently the spread of your data is the largest. So if you would want to cluster your data into different clusters, and the best chance you have, of course, is to find the, the axis along which it's most spread out and then just you know, chop it in the middle along that axis. So that's exactly what we are going to try to do, right? So you, once you have that axis, um, then what you can do with your data points, or, or alternatively, this is how the algorithm would do that, is you, you, you take an axis, you project all of your points data on that axis, and then you can take the variance along the axis. Um, and that's then what you optimize, right? Given then you optimize the angle of that axis. So instead of this picture on the left, now we take those readout signals. Um, and let's say we take 500 of type zero or 5,000 of type zero and 5,000 of type one. And that's really cheap for them. That's uh, you know, a few seconds uh, to do that. Um, so, and, and they know how to initialize in the zero and in the one, and they will make, they will have errors, um, but overall, like the majority in this set will be the zero and the one here. And now we do the most naive thing possible. So this can probably be optimized even further, but now we just say you have 3000 points along this X axis. Um, each of those points is just a, a number that we assign now on a uh, on an axis. So this whole this whole each of these snapshots, each of these readout traces is actually a point in a 3000 dimensional space, right? This data is just one big vector with 3000 entries. That's maybe another way of thinking of that. Uh, so now we have a you know 3000 dimensional data set with 10,000 points in it, 5000 from from each. And you know, we do principal component analysis. You find, you ask what is the axis along which they are separated. And it turns out um, if, you, if you find that axis, which is this one shown here, this on the x-axis, and you project in all, all of your samples onto that axis, you find indeed that they cluster on the left of the axis and on, on the right of the, of the zero of the axis, okay? And of course, you can also see how they're how they're distributed uh, within each of those blobs you get. But but here you, you exactly get the zeros, and here you get the, you get the ones. And now you may wonder how what is it you know how does this work? Why? Um, and uh, and the answer is it turns out it's really actually doing this this demodulation because um, you can take now that axis in these uh, 3000 dimensional space, the principal component vector, that would be this one. Um, and, uh, and what you're doing with these data sets is you're, these data points, you're projecting it onto that axis, right? So you're just taking the dot product between the two. And um, if you take this axis and look at its frequency components, then you see it has two very strong frequency components exactly at the frequency at that same omega frequency that, um, can I still go back there? Yeah, at exactly that same, this frequency that you use to, um, um, you know, read out your signal. So that's exactly here, that same red omega. And so if this, if this uh, PCA vector was just purely that, like uh, two, two delta peaks at the, those frequencies, uh, it, then it would, taking the dot product would exactly be multiplying with the sine wave, right? And integrating. So that's, it's, it's really, you know, it's doing, it's essentially doing the, the, um, the, the homodyne detection, except um, 
that it has a whole bunch of extra stuff that looks like noise. But I would argue uh, it's more structured than noise. We can go into that in more detail, but I would argue here, that's exactly what I said in the beginning. This extra noise is, is important. It automatically includes systematic noise and so on that is in your data set. So instead of demodulating with only one dominant frequency, there's you know tiny modulations on top that make the readout more efficient. So they, I don't have the, the numbers here. They they from the thresholding, if you give a you know a given amount of time to integrate in their homodyne detection, um, you the final fidelity that they care about for decent times was instead of 97%, 99%. So that's a 2% increase from something very simple. Um, and um, yeah, that 2% is still important um, to them. So moreover, I think, and- I yeah. have a question. So so how, how would this distinguish itself from doing like a Fourier transform directly on the signal that you have? So I guess that if you have something which is now a, something that is independent of, of time, right? You have the spectrum, then you could use this on an arbitrary length time series, say you had, if you only measure yeah. for 200 nanoseconds, then you could also do the same thing. Uh, and, and I guess you yeah. want a representation that is independent of the length of the, the data that you've, you've taken out. So maybe you can comment, or maybe you're coming to this now, sorry. No, no, yeah, no, that's a good question. I um, so <clears throat> I, this is not something I've included here now in the talk, but what, let me first say indeed like what you said um of obviously now what you would want to do is ask how low can i go right and uh, we have this data set we can also now you know chop it off at 500 nanoseconds and then do the pca and, and ask are those first 500 nanoseconds also enough to to get these blobs and actually i think the limit is around those 400 500 nanoseconds for this data set and for those if you PCA those, you you again see a strong component here, but you see much stronger sideband. So it's you start to force it to use other frequencies as extra information. Um, and um, so the the question about comparing that to a Fourier transform, um, I have to think about because I know that we just Fourier transform the data and the I think I have to get back to you on this. I think the the issue with that approach is that you is that the zero component um, is what will distinguish the the two cases. So the overall offset, because they're both offset a little bit in the uh, in the data set. But I think we ever went back to normalizing that. Uh, to be honest, I can check that. Okay, thanks. But yeah, because it seems to yeah. me that, that you're essentially learning some sort of um, a spec, like a spectrum of uh, yeah. like what what are important things, uh, uh, and this is should be exactly. time, this should be time invariant. So you could use this spectrum afterwards on shorter time series to this thing. Like, have you have you tried that? Oh, I see. No, no, I think that that's a very clever idea. We can talk about that more. Yeah, I see what you're saying. We have not uh, thought of that. So, yeah. Instead of that, I would love to talk more about that. Uh, actually, that would be very interesting. It's still an active, you know, thing that they're trying. But instead of that, we decided to focus on getting that readout time a little, you know, um, even faster. And then, and then, um, it, you know, this is how things evolved. It happened at uh, at the Niels Bohr Institute. There's also a very high and interesting presence of people who are involved with high energy physics and and in particular data readout analysis at atlas and, and at cern and uh, they play with fpgas field programmable gate arrays which is um, specialized hardware for, for running computations and pca like i just showed you is really just a dot product so it's a super simple thing to do on an fpga um, and that including that brought it made it possible to um, to read out the three qubits on that device there were four one of them unfortunately didn't work uh, but that three qubit um, uh, readout would still be possible um, in you know in in sub microsecond 
Um, so now you just have uh, three, three data streams coming in, one for each of the qubits. And uh, you, do, you do the dot product for each of them. And that can all be done in parallel. So we're adding more qubits uh, in that, uh, on that FPGA sort of chip in that sense, or it's just adding more signals, but they can all be done in parallel. So, uh, so there's no overhead for, for classifying more qubits. So here you can see, I should, I should have said that maybe more explicitly, the PCA axis for qubit one, for qubit two, and then the Z direction qubit three. And um, here you see explicitly those blobs, like the uh, one in the 1D case where there are the histograms. Here you get eight, eight, uh, eight nice blobs for all of the eight possible um, states that three qubits can have. Okay. Um, one other thing that you can then do in, in this direction, also for for future direction, we're not we're, in, we're of course not the the first and not also probably not the last and the only ones who are doing readout with um, machine learning inspired let's say techniques. And of course, there's several also with using um, feed forward neural networks, just regular neural networks. Most of it, I should say, has been done in superconducting uh, systems, not for spin qubits. But at some point, of course, you say, um, you know, out comes some data, and what you know, what the other underlying black box system is may not be important. But uh, it's not. Um, I just wanted to quickly show here that that PC actually does a pretty good job. You can add more noise, um, and then you know, you see a tiny little improvement if you really want between what a net CA and the idea of course being that the PCA is linear algebra and you can do more, you can do nonlinear tricks there too. Um, but um, the network is nonlinear and it, you know, it, it just deals a little bit better with noise. So I would argue that if you get to a point where this is your scenario where you have so much noise that you go from six, you know, sixty something percent to uh, sixty something plus two percent. That that change, you know, is not really useful. I think at the moment. Um, so, you know, at least we see that neural networks um, do the same thing. They can also be implemented fairly straightforwardly uh, on FPGA. So, there may be an advantage of using those for um, multiple qubits if you know that they are somehow correlated. Because that's also something the PCA might struggle with. Okay, good. Um, that was one. I think the next uh, is only very brief, but um, the next one is is um, focused on this quantum point contact, the QPC optimization, um, and that's sort of uh, including. That's more like a many. Um, relatively many for, for experiment in this case, um, variables optimization. And so for that, I um, want to very briefly, there's a, say what a quantum point contact is. There's much more physics going on uh, in these systems that then, then I give on here now. But the idea is that you have a two-dimensional system Electrons can flow around in a two-dimensional system, and uh, and you uh, make a constriction in the two-dimensional system. These are these gates. You do you can put a voltage on them, and by you know, of course making that. I'm not sure if I can draw that, but but making that voltage larger and larger, you can make this constriction here narrower and narrower, and um, that's what you see here on the on the right-hand side on this axis. So. This, this gate voltage, the more negative you make it in this direction, the more narrow you make, you, you pinch off this, this channel. And uh, if you, as you increase it, you open up this channel more and more. And what you see is that discrete amounts of electrons start to pass through. So it's not like a, like a water, like water that you may think of that flows through this. In this case, that channel, you have to think of the wave function, of course, in this case, uh, you open it up and um, single charges and in conductance, it, the image quality is not great, but it's uh, E squared over Planck's constant that, um, that go through, okay? Um, so that's the units here are in, uh, in units of conductance. 
And, and so each of these steps from two to three to four to five, six, etc., are individual channels opening up. And this staircase is really the hallmark of that, of that QPC physics. And um, this is another separate talk by itself, but, um, but the gist is here. So what they uh, did, and it's still being refined quite a bit actually, is they really literally fabricated the device that looks like this on let's say where this is sort of a 30 nanometer scale, one of those pixels. So now we have nine pixels in a three by three arrangement. And each of them has its own uh, gate electrode that um, there's a knob that we can uh, tune. And um, you should then imagine electrons that can flow from here to here, from one side to the other. And uh, these gates are now what we will use to make that constriction. Right? And the idea being that in these systems and these two dimensional um, electron gases, there's also disorder. Okay? And that's, of, that, that's what sets, or at least guided also the, the size of the, the choice for these pixels is that um, maybe if having them on, on the same sort of size, we can try to start to balance out the underlying sort of longer wave disorder. And that seems to work really well. Um, so on the left here, you see that same G disconductance in E squared over H. And then here's a, a voltage that's a, a um, maybe I should explain it a little bit. So what you see on the x-axis here is the, is the mean voltage of all of those nine pixels. That's the voltage that is being swept um, as a function of, you know, from minus 1.5 to minus 1.1. And initially then you keep track of, in this case, this is simulations. There are different, different runs um, that we did. Some of them start out better than, uh, um, than others. Um, and I'll show you what, what these mean in a moment. But um, then, the, and then the, the name of the game is, uh, you know, I, I give you a particular value for the mean of those nine pixels. Then of course there's still eight degrees of freedom left for you to choose what those what those pixels values should be uh, you know should take um, as long as the mean is fixed and of course on top of that there's constraints that you don't want each of those pixel gates to be more negative than minus two volt because otherwise you blow up the chip so you have all kinds of extra constraints there's all kinds of extra physics that goes in that that informs those constraints um, and then um let's say you pick your favorite optimizer and um, you define a cost function that says it takes this curve or this curve and qualifies how how much like a staircase it is that's what you optimize so we we literally call that the staircasing is and uh, and that's what it tries to optimize so the staircasing is given all of these constraints and and here, um, there's this gradient-free method. And the reason we, we chose that is because for nine, it, it's actually OK. But imagine if they now want to scale this to you know, five by five, you have 25 um, voltages. <coughs> Sorry. And uh, then if you want to do this gradient-based, then for each of those 25, you have to estimate the gradient. So for each of those 25, you have to do, keep all of them fixed and then change one like a plus delta V and a minus delta V and then estimate the gradient. Uh, and that just, that doesn't scale very well. So that means that for every, every step in your optimization you wanna take, you have to do order of 50 measurements already um, just to estimate the gradients. So gradient free in this case, we thought um, will scale better eventually. Um, and it, um, the way it does that, there's many different ones. We're using this covariance matrix adaptation, evolutionary strategy. You don't have to remember all of that. The idea is, is that in, you start with a population or a, a, a whole set of initial 
uh, solution. So each of those points in this example represents a choice of the nine voltages. And they all obey the constraint already that the mean of those is, is the same. So that should be a nine dimensional space. I'm just doing an example here for two dimensions. And then um, without going into too much detail, what this algorithm will do is it will update each of those members in the population based on you know, the covariance of that whole set. And it will slowly, you know, in this case, from here to here, that covariance increases quite a lot in, uh, in that direction towards the minimum. And eventually that's a way for this algorithm to sort of find and, uh, and shrink and wrap around or wrap inside that, uh, that optimum uh, here. Of course, this is also a, a very simple landscape, um, which in, in, for the, in real life is probably not that simple, but this is the idea of the algorithm. And that's why uh, in these previous plots, you saw those different curves. They, they, they belonged to different members of this population. Um, and then um, I think something went wrong here um, with the version of my slides, but that's okay. So the, uh, you, you have to then, of course, think about this staircase in this metric. That's what defines this landscape, right? The, the best staircase should sit uh, at this uh, minimum. Um, and there's many ways of doing that. We, can, we tried many different things. You can, of course, think of making like a, a histogram of this picture here on the right, you can like like a density of states, right? You can say, uh, can you how many states are there that are sort of flat, right? And then you can you can uh, assess the quality of that histogram, right? So the here just uh, I'm just counting how many states there are at a given uh, at a given conductance, and then of course you get peaks where the where there are plateaus, like you would expect from band structure, the same thing. Um, um, so yeah, you can also just think about taking a derivative, of course, right? If it, if you have very steep derivatives and then very flat regions, you can also make a staircasiness metric out of those. We found that some work better than others, but not drastically. Uh, just to say, um, yeah, okay. Something like something is a little missing here because now it jumps to the next topic. I just wanted to say the the closing things on this. So this. This sort of is now on the level of um, optimizing um, some uh, optimizing experiments with many variables, and um, it it proved very useful here because these devices uh, these devices were on fabricated on 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 wafers on chips that really weren't the best, uh, if I understood correctly, from the experimentalist. And still, um, this is not the best um, picture we have. And this is also on the simulation. This was actually done on actual experiments. And they get, they get very nice staircases, very good QPCs, even on, on those wafers they would have otherwise not um, used there. So um, yeah, more, more is being developed. Um, and um, it, it helps you breathe life into other, into older samples, for example, and, and without having to tune all of that yourself. And that, that last statement, um, with 45 minutes more or less, um, that last statement <coughs> is also um, what I wanted to talk about for the third and final example which is um, once, and this is what is happening now, people are making larger and larger quantum dot arrays. So this example you saw before, you have these two quantum dots, let's say double dot system, um, which had this, um, this is now simulated, this um, charge, um, charge, stability diagram, which just tells you as a function of those two voltages, again, on the, uh, on the X and Y axis, what are the charges on those two dots? Okay, so if you at zero and zero volt, there are zero and zero electrons respectively on those two dots. But then as you tune one, you start populating one of them with more and more electrons. <coughs> 
Okay, so that's all nice for two dots. Um, but now people are making four by four, maybe at some point. I think now um, that's that's doable. Um, but already for something like eight or, or six, like a two by three device, getting to a point in your experiment where you can actually make such a diagram is not trivial because you now have to simultaneously find, so it, you know, I'm just having arbitrary numbers, axes uh, here, but tuning your those six voltages into a regime where you where you have this stability charge stability diagram um, is not easy and is a task that can take um, <coughs> sorry a month or so for a PhD student to sort of for that one sample optimize all of that and um, you don't have an easy way of visualizing it either in higher dimensions in three dimensions. And these these become three dimensional polytopes. Like it's a bit hard to see here, but now you have three axes: uh, v1, v2, and v3 into the page. And uh, and now this thing is a three dimensional object. And you would want to know as an experimentalist um, if you want to then use these as as dots, for example. And now maybe if you have larger rates, you can define multiple qubits. How do I like? In what combination? what linear combination of voltages do I have to tune to move across a particular transition? So here it's, it's fairly simple. I mean, if you want to move from here, maybe I should do a lighter color from here to here, well then, you know, then you can just tune this axis. But um, if you want to do this particular transition from the, or, or, or this one, which, one is, which is the one we discussed before, <clears throat> First of all, it's very narrow, but also you don't you don't want to just tune only v two because if you just if you go straight down, you end up in the wrong state, straight here in the wrong state. So you want to find this this axis. And um, <clears throat> the problem then becomes one of finding these polytopes, right? It's a computationally speaking, it's a polytope fitting problem. Um, because these objects, Coulomb diamonds, right? Uh, they're in they're just high dimensional polytope. Um, <clears throat> and so, turning this into a machine learning problem, um, I'll speed up a little bit. But the idea I think is very straightforward and very clever. Is to do this instead of doing these raster based scans that you say I fix all my voltages except for two and then I make like a, a scan then you get sort of a cut through your high dimensional space. You start shooting rays so you pick a particular direction and voltage phase along which you evaluate your sensor data. And then you record the points where that sensor data um, indicates a step. And then at that point, you know that you hit a, you, you changed the transition, you, you crossed the transition. And whenever you see that, you record a blue dot and a red dot. Blue is just before the transition and, right, and red is right after that change in signal. And you do that in, initially in uniformly distributed on the, on the sphere in high dimensional space. And so you create a data set where you have a whole bunch of blue points and a whole bunch of red points. And then the problem of finding the polytope is just one of binary classification. You want to find the boundary that runs between all of the blue points and all the red points, because you know all of the blue points are inside and all the red points are outside. And um, you know that's in a nutshell already the entire algorithm. Of course, then you want to make sure that you're um, doing this properly. So given that you have an idea of those boundaries, you can then start to verify or falsify them. You can say, if the boundary is really here, then if I shoot a ray in that direction, I should find, again, a red and a blue point. And, um, and that's what you can then iterate until, you have, until you're satisfied, until you think, now, now I really believe that this facet of my polytope is there. 
and you set some precision, of course. Uh, again, also here, there's much more that goes on behind it. But you can see in the 2D case, for example, um, this is a 2D cut through a 3D uh, space diagram. Maybe hard to see the blue dots, but you see there's a whole bunch of dots on these facets that, um, that the algorithm then would find to determine this polytope. Um, yeah, and so this is then useful in, in, uh, in this case. This is now a six dot system, a two by three system, where maybe you would want to do an experiment where you exchange two electrons. So you would have an electron sitting here first and, and here. That's what's indicated here by the one and one and zero and all the others. And then what you do is you, um, you, you move this electron up and to the right. That's what you see here, it moves up and then it moves to the right. So you park it, and then you move the, the red one down. And then uh, this one moves down. That's what you see here, moves down, here moves down, and then you unpark the blue one. That's a, that's a sequence you would use in the experiment to do this electron exchange. And that means that now in this, in this picture or in the polytope picture, each of these are particular charged states, right? Tells you exactly you have, uh, you know, it's the, uh, it's the equivalent of the 101 and the 111 here. Now, instead of specifying three numbers, you specify six numbers, one for each of the, uh, the, the, um, the dots. And then doing this sequence requires you to know along which voltages do I have to tune so that I, you know, move to the, move from one charge that I'm in to the one that I want to be in. And so then this algorithm we develop tells you exactly what, what these, what the polytopes that you need um, to do this transition are and what the voltage axes are that you need to tune to make that um, experiment. And, and this is something you input as a user. You can, you can give it such a sequence and tell it, find all the polytopes and transition that are required for that. Um, yeah, so I talked about polytopes a lot. Now this, how we do that then is, is um, actually um, maybe very quickly straightforward, uh, I hope. So a polytope, uh, so this, let's say if, we, if this yellow thing is the polytope rafter, in this case, it's just 2D, you specify a polytope by um, so-called half planes. It just you specify a normal vector and an offset from the origin. Um, and if the normal vector is one, one, it's this vector, of course. And then the offset is one, that this is the origin. So then that it defines this plane, this line. And uh, if you say everything that's above that, then you get this orange region. So you, the, um, the polytope is defined by a set of inequalities, basically saying everything that it's not part of. Um, and uh, therefore, it's defined by this set of A, the normal vectors, and the offsets. And that's what the model is about. So the model that we have is just a, a model for a polytope. Um, and instead of it being um, perfectly sharp, doing this uh, logarithm of sum of exponentials, you can, you can uh, fudge a little. You can make it less sharp. Uh, which is easier for fitting and for learning with the maximum likelihood. Okay. That's more technical. Suffice to say that the algorithm very successfully finds polytopes in high dimensional spaces. There's more works on that. I want to show them here. There's one that I didn't list, uh, I realize, um, which is from um, Justina Zolak at, uh, in NIST in Boulder. And, uh, they, they do this ray-based idea too, and they uh, find very nice bounds on the minimum number of rays you have to shoot to determine the polytopes. So I will end with a quick bonus. Um, if, if you thought all of this was not interesting, hopefully you think this is interesting. Take a look at, at quantum chess and quantum tic-tac-toe. Um, if you wanna you know, teach or uh, quantum concepts or play chess and want to do quantum chess puzzles or so. Uh, I just wanted to flash this, take a look at it if you're and see if you're interested. And uh, if you are, you know, reach out. So with that, 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Eva, for a very nice and interesting uh, presentation, a very broad set of topics. Do we have any questions from the audience? I have one question, or well, some, some questions. Uh, uh, in the qubits uh, example that you mentioned, yeah. uh, do you get something uh, different if you use, for instance, a TICA instead of a PCA? Um, here, so you're asking, if we get something different, if if we use something else than PCA, you mean just the not the PCA method, but something else like some other clustering method? No, I, I mean a, a Tika. So Tika is a time time yes. lag independent component analysis, and I think ah. if, if are you familiar with this, Eva, this method? No, not yet. I, I don't think that this will work here because there's no time structure in the independent independent samples. So yeah, time series is a time series, but then you have multiple time series, and there's no relationship between the time series. If I understood this setup correctly, is that correct? Eva? That's right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. No, that's right. Yeah. So so the mm -hmm. idea the the idea of Tika is basically that you find a subspace where you maximize the auto correlate the auto and cross correlation between the so it's similar to PCA, but you are computing yep. uh, time-lagged covariance matrices instead. Sorry right. for interfering. <laughs> no, no, that's good. No, no, I would, that, uh, that is much better answer than I could have given, yeah. Yeah, I, and the, the second question that I had is uh, related to the FPGAs. Yeah. Uh, do you know that if this, uh, uh, operation runs uh, faster on GPUs than on FPGAs or? Um, I short answer is I don't know. This would be maybe a question that I can pose or forward to you to the, uh, the one who actually implemented the FPGA. Um, I, you know, I think though that probably it's definitely not slower, I guess, because it's really low level electrical signals that, that you work uh, with on the FPGA, right? You really just, yeah, you burn you burn in the, uh, the, uh, the um, whatever algorithm it, it is that you wanna do on the lowest logic level. And uh, an advantage, I guess, yeah. So there's no, there's no, um, how do I say that? There's no other layer of extra, ex, abstraction um, below the FPGA for us here. Whereas on the GPU, it is optimized for a floating point and these vector op operations. But I can imagine that maybe there is some overhead in particular on getting the raw signal onto the GPU. And here we don't have that. It's the raw signal is fed directly into the FPGA. Maybe there's others here who have more experience with that than I do. Um, but yeah, um, this plus the parallel inputs, I think I think the FPGA for this particular sort of specialized direct application will win out on the GPU by a little bit. But I, I wouldn't put my hand into the fire for that statement. Then we would really have to talk to an FPGA expert. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. So I had a question regarding this, this staircase in this. I didn't quite understand what you converged on, what kind of loss function, objective function you converged at. Uh -huh. So what, yeah, so. Uh, it's a yeah, pretty technical yeah. question, I suppose, but. Yeah, I think, uh, so that unfortunately that part of something went wrong. I apologize for that with the slides. That, that something is missing. There was more on that. So the, the um, what you can think of, for example, um, I think what we started with as a loss, as a cost function is, well, so the cost function should m measure how staircasiness a curve is, right? And so the, um, what we thought 
that we would do initially is we would um, we would basically want to check how flat are these are these regions. And then of course you want to you want to do like a derivative, right? The, like a dg dv, um, and the you know the the lower that is, the better in this case. Um, and you then you can do something a little bit more clever because you have these step regions, and um, maybe it's okay if they're not perfectly sharp. So then you can you can start playing around with sort of powers here, making maybe a square root or so. The, the issue with that, um, and then it's a measure of do you want to optimize or minimize this, of course, but the question with this derivative, or the problem, sorry, with this derivative approach is that you minimize this perfectly by also just staying uh, flat at the, at the bottom. So right, then, then the derivative is everywhere zero and, uh, and that's the lowest you can go. Um, so that was not very useful because that's exactly then what the what the system was finding. It's just pinching off the entire channel. Um, and then of course you can start to, you know, and then you realize quickly that if you start to penalize it, to penalize it for for being at zero, um, that also doesn't work because then it just starts making a very large plateau at one, for example. Um, so what we are currently doing is is this histogram approach where you you take this you take your curve your staircase curve and you you do like a density of states you you squash it against the uh, the the wall and you and you have um, you have all these measurement points here right so the histogram is just it just counts how many are there here right and how many are there at different values of, of conductance um and uh, and you get you get these histogram, and then you can uh, you can ask you know about the width of these histograms. The narrower they are, the better, of course. The more the flatter they are, the higher they are, the better. So the metric is now fully based on that. But um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, that 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 yeah. explains it better. Uh, I think you explained, but I didn't quite get this detail. Thank thanks a lot. I think sure. yeah. 